Welcome to STEMiverse Podcast Episode 35. In this episode, Peter and Marcus talk with Dr. Jason Zagami. Dr. Jason Zagami is an academic in the School of Education and Professional Studies of Griffith University on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia, where he teaches and conducts research in educational technologies and computer science education for K-12. In his work in innovations in educational technologies, Jason focuses on the identification of emerging trends, educational gaming such as VR, AR and VWs, student co-creation of secondary worlds and neural cognitive activity measurement. In the field of computer science education K-12, Jason focuses on curriculum implementation approaches involving higher order thinking, skill development, concept development through visualizations and manipulation, including visual programming, concept development through the use of manipulables such as robotics, drones and IoT, and challenges for female participation in computer science education. Jason has many years of experience in K-12 computer education and teacher education. He's been the recipient of the Outstanding National Achievement by a Teacher and the Queensland Computer Educator of the Year Awards. He's an Apple Distinguished Educator, a Google Certified Innovator, a past president of the Australian Council for Computers in Education, a past president of the Queensland Society for Information Technology in Education, an editor for the Australian Educational Computing Journal, and president of the Australian College of Educators at the Gold Coast region. Way to go, Jason. This is STEMiverse Podcast Episode 35. STEMiverse is a podcast produced by Tech Explorations. Our mission is to help educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. Whether you are a professional or casual teacher teaching in a classroom or a parent or cat taker teaching at home, This podcast brings you the knowledge and experiences of practitioners, academics, entrepreneurs, and lifelong learners who are passionate about education and strive every day to help our children prepare for life in a world of radical change and, why not, abundance. This podcast is brought to you by Tech Explorations, a leading provider of educational resources for makers, STEM students, and teachers. For a limited time only, go to texplore.com slash stemiverse and receive Peter's latest ebook, Maker Education Revolution, a book about how making is changing the way that people learn and teach in the 21st century. Marcus, you're still here. What's happening? Very long time no see. <laughs> Since last week, right? No, actually, like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> if that's... Yeah, we had two episodes to record today. Back-to-back back podcasts. Yeah. We had uh, Dr. Hunter earlier, Jay, mm-hmm. um, Jane Hunter, and now we have Dr. Jason Zagami, who is uh, a academic from Griffith University at the School of Education and Professional Studies. Hi, Jason. Hi, guys. How are you today? I'm good. How is uh, Queensland, Gold Coast in particular? Very sunny and very blue skies, very tempting to be out riding. Uh, every time I hear Gold Coast, I remember holidays. Mm-hmm. Is that how you feel after living in the Gold Coast for a while? It's nice to live somewhere where other people save up to go on holidays. <laughs> yes, I know. Why but, do you live on the Gold Coast? Yeah. I well, should ask that question. Why do you live on the Gold Coast? What is the attraction? Oh, the beach and the rainforest and the... It's just a nice lifestyle. There's mm. lots of... A bit like Melbourne, there's lots of food places, um, there's always something happening, things going on, and people love to come and stay and visit. Yeah, it mm. is a relaxed place. Uh, that's the feeling you get. We were just get... there this, uh, this year in Tugan yeah. for a week yeah. and a bit. So on the Gold Coast. Great. Oh, we'll be back <laughs> on the next holiday. <laughs> so, Jason, would, would you like to take a few minutes and tell us a bit about you and uh, your background and what brings you to STEM education and and the research that you're doing now. Okay, well, I came through as a teacher and 
was very involved in the development of um, computer education, also very involved with professional associations for teachers. So over the years, I've been president of the Queensland Society for Information Technology and Education, and then became president of the Australian Council for Computers and Education at a particularly interesting time when we were supporting the development of the Australian curriculum around computing. So we put a lot of input into and assisted in developing that curriculum and getting it accepted by various political groups and other groups around the nation. And now I spend a fair bit of time assisting in the, that implementation process. Last year, I did an online professional development course for 1,500 Queensland teachers on how to teach uh, the new digital technologies curriculum. And I've been involved with various other groups developing materials to assist in that process. But of course, as an academic, I'm also involved in preparing new teachers and helping them through and supervising PhD students and of course, doing my own research. My research started off looking at how, how students can best learn computer programming languages. That was my doctoral thesis. And in particular, looking at some, at that stage, some new advances in brain science um, to try to understand the processes we go through um, with a particular emphasis on the use of visual programming languages where we use icons and graphics rather than textual programming languages. Yeah. So languages like Scratch, for example. Yes. Well, that was certainly one of them, um, but there was, a, there was a whole range of others. Sure. And they allow students to process their thoughts about the decisions they make in how to get things to work in a programming language in different ways. But since then, I've been doing other research. Uh, my sort of long-term research area is around brain science, looking at EEG headsets and how to actually implement those into classrooms, um, in particular, setting it, things up where all the students can be wearing EEG headsets. And rather than trying to get individual results on students, which can only really happen in a laboratory environment, um, of course, it's quite complex and it takes a long time to analyze, providing teachers with feedback on their entire class in terms of their overall aggregated brain activity and their engagement with the learning content and whether or not the areas of the brain that should be firing um, are firing when they're going through various tasks is an area that I'm exploring. Wow, that is quite intriguing. Uh, mm. I never heard of something like that before. So in my mind right now, I've got a classroom say of 20 kids and there's wires coming out of the kids' heads connected to a computer at the teacher's desk. And the teacher can see every single thought that the student is having. Is that uh, what's happening in actuality? Well, don't stop there. Surely there's the what? other foot that's about to drop, which is the automation where the children are not... Remote control. Yeah, if they're not doing the right thing, you can zap them. And have this all automated. I think you're going too far, but could you explain that a bit more, Jason, please? Strangely, a lot of teachers jumped to that initial um, <laughs> thought of being able to Frankenstein Im impact their students through um, these devices. But no, it's a one-way transmission process, and we've advanced to wireless technologies, so we don't need to have wires going everywhere. <laughs> uh, they're, they're simply headsets, a little bit like headphones mm -hmm. that the students can put on. Um, they don't need a lot of fiddling around, although some of them are a little bit more tricky. But the reality is you can't get very high fidelity readings, even on an individual student, unless you spend a lot of time getting it set up correctly and analyzing the data. And that's something that teachers can't do in the classroom because they don't have time to sit there analyzing brainwave patterns. But by averaging a whole class, the teacher can get quite good feedback, not on a specific student, but on the class as a whole as to whether or not the patterns that should be being seen for that particular learning activity are being seen. And that can provide very good, particularly in teacher training and just giving teachers feedback on students' attention. Because um, it's, it's one of the examples I do with teachers is showing them what happens when they show a video. And brain activity almost drops to nothing. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, meaning that what the students are not actually seeing that just that you know they're, they're looking at the video but they're not processing it correct very much they, they go into an entertainment mode where oh, a passive entertainment <laughs> process because that's what they used to be right. when watching tv at home 
Is that a new um, phenomenon? No, it's been around. The phenomenon's been around quite a while in terms of studying TV and so forth. But the equation into a classroom is quite interesting. And it also has similar impact when teachers are doing expositions or explaining information. And it, it shows quite dramatically the whole aspect around what's now called active learning, hmm. where students are actively involved in a process of learning rather than passively receiving information or, um, and so forth. So just to, to understand this better, of course, there's so many different tools we can use in a classroom. Uh, playing a video of, say, a TED talk is one of them. Uh, there's audio that we can play instead of uh, video plus audio. Then there's other instruments that can get students to make something, for example, or perhaps to listen to a presentation on PowerPoint. So traditionally, we would gauge whether those uh, options or tools are effective by doing a test perhaps later on to see whether the students retained any useful information. But if I understand right, what you are doing with this uh, brain to computer interface is to see in real time whether there is any activity in the brain that would suggest that the students are actually learning and paying attention. Is that the idea behind this? Correct. That's my long term goal to replace the need for assessment with basically a continuous assessment process where we're picking up on the patterns that should be being exhibited when students are doing different activities. And if that's not happening, then the teacher can apply some intervention, either to individuals or to the group or to their own practice. So you mentioned that you're doing this in aggregate. How hmm. are you getting the signals and combining them and averaging them? Or weighing them. Yeah, that's the bit that I'm having uh, the difficulties with at the moment. The moment I'm doing it not in real time with 30-odd mm -hmm. 30 30 odd process signals and then analysing those after the event. My aim is to develop an app that will take in the 30-odd um, signals at once and then provide a visual display to the teachers of the aggregated um, brainwave um, signals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why would you go for an aggregate though instead of individual? Like uh, if I was a teacher, I'd like to have my control panel and to see gauges showing uh, the attention <laughs> index of yeah. each student and Bob's attention index was like below zero, and then I, I would focus on Bob and try to see if I can improve that for that single student. It's especially in a time where we hear so much about mass customization of education. Yeah. You seem to be almost going the other way. Long term, that would obviously be the ideal, but the technology is nowhere near that ah. at this stage and the ability for people to interpret the data is nowhere near there. Mm. And that's where a lot of people are making overblown claims about brain interface devices uh, because you don't know if Bob is simply thinking about the beach yep. rather than about his maths problem. Um, there's a whole range of things that take quite a lot of interpretation of the data to make it valid. And a teacher just doesn't have the time to do that in a classroom in mm. space. So the aggregate process is the best solution at the moment to provide meaningful information to the teacher. It's a first step, in other words. Yes. Getting to a, like an individualized type of display in real time. So how are you displaying the analytics to the teachers? Uh, well, it, it goes through to um, mobile devices. And at the moment, I can set it up with 30 mobile devices showing each of the signals. But that's overwhelming to the teachers yeah. and to myself even. So it's now I'm looking at processes to combine that information to make it then meaningful. Hmm. How many channels do you get per student? Uh, depending upon the devices, the the easy ones that I use are five. They're the ones that are just slip on quickly. Um, the more detailed EEG headsets get 12 channels. But for the most purposes of what we need to do with the, the teachers, the five channels is sufficient. Okay. Have you had to consider any of the ethical implications of, I guess, you're sort of bordering on health and, uh, I guess, storage of Biology, data and... Yes. Uh, yeah. There are always ethical aspects around any use of technology and research, um, and we go through all those processes through our ethical clearance in, uh, processes at universities. We get consent before we hand it over. That's but, really cool. But I think at, at the moment, the practical application of this technology would be in teacher training, right? Or do you see it actually being a mainstream technology that, say, a, a public or private school would be able to deploy to its classes? Well, 
my expertise is obviously around teacher education. So I tend to focus on the teacher education applications. Certainly there are lots of other potential applications from relaxation and anxiety, anxiety um, reduction. Mm. There's a whole field that's opening up in that. There's a whole area around marketing and those aspects of trying to work out what students get engaged with when they're using various tools and textbooks and all the rest. They're not my areas of interest, so I'm not particularly focused on those, but there's certainly a wide range of applications for this sort of technology. Is the metric you're looking at engagement or is there some other metric that you're looking at? Engagement is the easiest one to measure. Um, it's also the one that's most easy to distort by the student if they want to distort it. What um, my long-term goal is to actually to develop up patterns of um, expected brainwave signals um, when certain cognitive activities are being done. So if they're actually going through some analysis tasks, then there should be certain areas of the brain that should light up um, when that's happening. And then if those things aren't happening, then it flags to the teacher that something needs to be done. Mm -hmm. All right. That's the fundamental basis. But that's only just one area of my research. It's, it's an area that's a long-term one that it'll take a number of years before we see any real fruit in that space. Have you actually gone down that route and, I guess, implemented custom classifiers and throwing it into a system yet? Or is that still in the future? It's nowhere near to the point where I can say it's even possible at this stage. Yeah. Okay. So, But it's one of the areas that I'm hoping to see is possible. That would be great, I think. Like, uh, uh, everything's become just in time, I suppose, now to have this kind of visibility. I'm just thinking from the point of view of the teacher getting feedback, live feedback from the, I had this problem as a teacher myself. Is anybody listening and nobody would put up the hand? You know, I mean, now I don't have to ask at all with this kind of technology. So like instant a, inf feedback. Like a political uh, speech or what call it, <laughs> debate. You'll have the worm in real time. Yeah. There's a range of new technologies that are emerging into education similar to this. Um, galvanic skin response was trialled by the Gates Foundation and a big, where every, all the students wore wristbands that could take that sensor data and provide it to teachers. But it's all around being able to actually take lots of data and then use it in an effective way to inform the teaching and learning process. But that then also brings us into the whole area of automation of teaching, where we can use robots and AI systems to conduct a lot of the teaching processes. Yeah. Have you seen any successful automation of teaching already? Yes, and that's the area I'm exploring this year. Um, I've got a robot that I'm going to have teach some of my classes. <sighs> but the easy bit is to have it actually present PowerPoint presentations. That's, that's, that's a no-brainer. The more complex part is where it can actually recognise the students and have a specific process built in to taking in other data from what the students are doing on their learning management systems and assessment tasks and providing specifically directed questions to those students. And in my case, we're talking about 100 plus students, which is quite a daunting thing to try to cope with as a lecturer. But a automated system where it knows each student and it, their strengths and weaknesses and interests and being able to direct specific questions to those different students can take things beyond what I'm able to do as a human being. So that's the area that I'm exploring. Are you going to prototype this or is it just conceptual yes. at the stage? No, no, I'm doing that this um, this year. I'm just about finished programming of it. I've got to ask, how, what did you use for programming it? Uh, well, it's a Nao robot. That's the but what I'm the complex aspects I'm having at the moment is interfacing with some data collection processes through their learning management systems. Mm -hmm. um, so the students do quizzes, and they may even be in in lecture polling and so forth, and having that fed directly in a real time way into the robot. The moment I've got to program it in afterwards, and it's a bit, it's not real time. So I'm just working on ways to speed up that process. So that's a software bot, like physical like robot. The, is it physical robot, like that can actually move, like it's got yes. atoms in it, or a bot, chatbot? It's a one meter tall robot. Ah, right, okay. But I'm also using chatbots and other AI systems to collect mm. data from the students and build into a profile of each of them to have that interaction. But the physical robot does the lecture presentation and the interactions with the students during the lecture time. I sit in the in the lecture theatre with the students and interact with the robot. So I would imagine there's quite a lot of aspects to this project from the, hmm. I guess, building up the profile of the students based on the information to the actual presentation and then 
I guess, the engagement with the students, how do you build up that profile or how will you do that? What are you programming it in? And just to add to that question, what is the minimal capability that the robot will have or should have in order to make it a viable replacement for somebody like you? Well, at the moment, of course, we're only in prototyping and so forth. I'm only doing it with five volunteer students in the front row mm. in terms of the facial recognition and the directly targeted questions. All the students are contributing information to the through the chatbot systems that answer their questions on the course ah, right. and other quizzes and things like that that we're, I'm using to build their interactive profile. But at the moment, of course, the capabilities of the robot, I'm not wanting to – it's meant to be able to do 16 people and – in the future, it'll obviously do many more. I'm waiting on some new advances in facial recognition to be able to do the 100 or so at once. Hmm. The technology exists, but it's not easy to use technology just yet. It's mostly being used by surveillance departments and all the rest. And yeah. Yeah. So it's not really at the point where we can simply put it into a system. Is your intention to do all the programming on the robot? Or are you going to offload the smarts to, I guess, say a web service? At the moment, it's happening on the robot simply because of the ease of use of the having it all on one system. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in the future, that it'll go beyond the capacity of that robot to efficiently process that amount of information. And the chatbots and so forth are much more. Um, Watson is the one I'm looking at using as the main AI system to process it all in the long term. But for convenience at the moment, it's easy to have it happen on the robot because I've got to give it all the external data manually at the moment anyhow. So it's not a, a complexity I need to involve having real-time communication. And when you program the robot, is that visually or is that in a programming language of some sort? How do you program the did, robot? Did you program it in Ruby? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I did not ask that question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a civic programming language um, developed for with the robots. It's It's quite similar to, oh, it's a drag and drop programming language, essentially. Oh, yeah. um, but more wireframing than um, what you'd be used to in Scratch. And is this a language that is optimized for building AI systems? It was developed for AI systems right. specifically for this robot, Interesting, yes. Interesting, yeah. Jason, I want this, especially because we were talking to Jane earlier and we brought up pedagogy on top of ethics. Uh, what are the pedagogical implications of having a robot, however advanced it may be, to deliver a lesson uh, in terms of, you know, the connection between a teacher and a student, um, that, that is something that's been noted. And before you answer that question, or maybe as part of that question, yeah. do you actually have to use a robot? Could you just present it on the screen, or do you have the same situation where the students are essentially believing they're watching a video and then tuning out. I think out. that's just a different question there. Uh, let's, let's hold it. Uh, okay. Suggestion. Because I, I want to focus on the pedagogy first and the human-human connection, what happens to our learning uh, experience, I suppose, if we remove the human teacher, replace it with a machine, whether it's a PowerPoint or a video playing or a bot chatting to us or a physical robot. They're very similar questions. Essentially, the course that I'm teaching, they're using the robots to teach, is a course in the future of educational technologies and where educational technologies are going. So this fits in very well with the content of the course. So the students are already thinking about what is the potential for technology to impact on education? And this is being used as an applied example of that happening. That said, I've done a lot of work um, in schools with this robot, and it's very surprising how quickly the students will treat the robot as a human being. Yeah. And it's a very, very quick suspension of disbelief for uh, people to start engaging with this technology as though it is a real human person. Hmm. This particular robot, while it, it is has, has got legs and arms and a head and so forth, uh, there are more advanced robots that look like people. But for young children in particular, which is sort of the context that we're talking about in terms of replacing teachers in particular, they have no problems at all in accepting a robot as a, a, as a teacher. In, in as that a context. teacher, yeah. And why do you think that is? Well, there's a whole range of reasons. And in fact, there is some, a lot of research being done in the area of autism and the use of these robots. 
where the robots are actually proving more effective than human teachers. Of course, the robots are more patient. They express emotions in a more simplified and easier to understand way. Yeah. And they can be programmed to engage very, very effectively with human beings. That's so amazing. Obviously, we're only in very early steps in this space, and they'll get far, far better, uh, particularly when the marketing people get behind it all and start doing it for other purposes. But there's lots of cases where we're using robotic devices to interact with humans in a way that evokes emotional interactions. Uh, they're using robot fur seals with patients in hospitals. Yes. There's lots and lots of examples where... So the idea of actually people being not accepting of the interactions because it is a robot device is probably going to be quite short-lived. Hmm. Certainly it exists as a problem at the moment, but I don't think it'll be a long-term problem. That is a new technology. I know that in Japan, I've read that somewhere perhaps the new scientist magazine, I can't remember exactly where, showing how uh, in nursing homes, the use of robots to keep company to people that don't really have family visiting them has really improved the quality of life of those people. And I also know about what you mentioned um, in terms of interaction between robots and kids with uh, in the autism spectrum and how that makes learning easier for them and definitely a lot less stressful than if they were in a classroom with other kids and a human teacher. Absolutely. Hmm. Is the physicality? Yes, and, and the physicality embodiment does play a big part in that. If it's just a screen-based interaction, that certainly is being shown to have some um, aspects, but our understanding of avatars online is quite different to our understanding of robots and how we interact with them. They may merge in the future, but I think we're a lot further from that acceptance than we are of the physical devices. But probably the biggest step that we will see in the future is where we have individual robots um, for each student. And that robot is able to make a really strong personal connection with that child and guide their learning far, far, in far, far more detail than a human being ever could. Hmm. And that's where teaching assistant robots, um, I think, will be the biggest innovation, where each student will have this robot device that works with them as they're coloring in and doing their math problems and doing their English and all the rest, and the teacher supervises the whole process. Yeah, that's incredible. There's also the uh, relevant area, just going slightly away from robots, but into things like uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and virtual worlds as well that I, th I think that you are also researching. Could you tell us a bit about the developments in those areas? Well, they've had a rocky ride. Um, certainly 10 years ago, virtual worlds were the biggest huge thing. And I got lots of grants to explore uh, the use of virtual worlds. And we created I created one for the university and we I was doing lectures and tutorials inside this virtual campus. And it looked as though it was going to go It'd be the next big thing. But it all died away. 20 years ago, um, when I first started teaching, I started into virtual reality. It had virtual reality headsets, and that was going to be the next big thing way back then. Since then, both virtual reality and virtual worlds are making a resurgence, and we're looking at how they may emerge again into education. It's still not at all clear whether or not they will, um, having been through the boom and bust cycle before. Mm. But... Is it different this time? Uh, no. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of money and hype being put into it, both pretty much exactly the same as before. More money this time, but it's still the same hmm. level of hype without any real applied examples of it working effectively. Game changer or killer. Yeah. Killer so having, having seen a couple of boom and bust cycles, why do you think it failed in the past? Uh, it has to get to a level of scale, and it has to reach a commercial level where people start doing it in their homes. The closest I see for that happening is HoloLens. Uh, if that becomes part of Skype and becomes part of our natural process of communicating, but while they remain as devices that you've got to do as something different, and like I've got all the virtuality stuff and I, I use it and all the rest and I'm a great advocate of it, but until it's something that's as easy to use as our mobile devices in our laptops. Oh, yeah. okay. And it's nowhere near there yet. There is talk about it going wireless and becoming to that level of capacity, but mm -hmm. yeah. Then it's just the usability, really, the fact that you've got to plug cables in, put something heavy on your head, which becomes sweaty after a while. You know, you need a powerful console or computer to, to power all that and drive it, or that just adds to no, complexity. No, no. 
No. It's more, it's more <laughs> that it, you have to be a, a hobbyist in technology hmm. to engage with it. And for those of us that are hobbyists in technology, it's fantastic. But for 90% of the world, they don't want to have to fiddle around with the latest computer and all these wires and devices and so forth to engage with that space. Mm -hmm. And for most teachers, they don't want to engage with that sort of technology if it's that level of complexity. For some of us who love that complexity, it's fantastic. But for the majority, it's just not worth the effort. What about augmented reality with a device that you just put on his glasses like Google Glass? which seems to be very unintrusive to me and simple to use. Could, could there be something there? Absolutely. And it will continue to develop. Well, it is continuing to develop. A whole range of those devices are coming out. I saw this week that um, some Chinese guards on the, in the train stations in China have been wearing them to detect potential dissidents. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the technology is moving ahead. And as soon as it's reasonably available, I'll, I'll get one, no doubt course, I love technology, but there needs to be a mainstream application for it. And the closest we've got really at the moment is being able to communicate with other people and having them appear in front of us as a hologram and being able to interact with them. I think that could be a game changer type interaction that will let the technology advance forward. All the other applications can really be done by mobile devices, yeah. but it's the functionality of being always on and being able to interact through our vision That's what it gives the extra bonus to. And we need to have applications that take advantage of that rather than just our location awareness, which we can do through our mobile devices. Does education really need all this new technology? I remember when I was growing up, we had a blackboard. I learned just fine, uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> do we really need augmented reality to learn how to count, perhaps, or how to write and read? Education is about preparing students for the world. And if the world is immersed in technology, it would be a poor education if we didn't prepare them for that world. So I don't live in a blackboard world anymore, right? That's a problem. Or that's a difference, not a problem. That's a difference for my kids. Well, the blackboard is a technology. Yeah. And it serves its purpose. I'm looking at your door here, Peter. <laughs> Peter has a blackboard. I still have a blackboard. <laughs> There are times when the use of a blackboard is an appropriate technology, yeah. but there are a whole range of other technologies that are also appropriate at different times and for different learning outcomes. And a good teacher has a suite of technologies that they can utilize for different circumstances. Um, sitting around and reading a book is appropriate at certain times, but there's other times when it's appropriate to use virtual reality or um, videos or other technologies. Hmm. So the message is that education must keep up with the way that the society in general changes, which does involve a lot of new technology. And there are the known improvements of, say, efficiencies, productivities in, in the industry. And through these technologies, what we hope to achieve is better learning outcomes, right, for students, which is the equivalent of efficiency and productivity in the industry. Would that be a fair conclusion? It is around the process of education, But we also need to consider the content of education. Hmm. For example, science education at the moment is very woefully out of step with what real world science now is. Hmm. 95% of real world science now involves the use of computers. But that's not the way we teach science or mathematics or most of our. So the longer we keep to older ways of doing things, the more out of touch and irrelevant some of our teaching becomes. So The digital technologies curriculum, for example, was a process to try to uh, reverse that. Of course, we've now moved industry away from manufacturing to high technology and service industries, predominantly involving the use of information technology. We now need to prepare our students to be able to engage with those industries from a very early age. And we haven't been doing that for a while because we put too much of a focus on ICT and not enough on computer science and the computer industry um, processes. Yeah. Um, I'm also looking at your work uh, in the context of computer science education and in particular the development of manipulatives or learning through manipulatives like robotics drones and uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, how does that come into your work uh, in the context of what we have spoken about already? But and also maybe in, in a more practical way, why do we need robots in the classroom, apart from becoming teachers eventually? And you talk about manipulatives there. How would you define a manipulative? Or what is a manipulative, maybe, to begin with that, yeah? 
Okay. The way I define a manipulative is it's a device that students can make changes to that assist them in their learning of concepts. So a robotic device allows them to understand a little bit about robots because they can build their own robot. But it might be a programming device for young children where they use particular blocks and put them in an order to create a sequence of instructions that teaches them about the concept of sequencing or of iteration and so forth. So they're physical, generally physical devices, although some can be a blending of digital and physical, but they involve a process whereby students actively do things to the devices. Now, programming languages are the obvious manipulatives, but they tend to be mostly digital. But more and more, we're getting tools and games and devices that allow students to physically create computer programs or electronic devices um, and so forth and learn about those concepts without simply doing them just on the programming language. Which one of these manipulatives have you found the most exciting? <laughs> oh, drones are always the most engaging for <laughs> students. I think, of course, the potential of death. Uh, <laughs> but The risk. <laughs> yeah. But there's a whole range of tools that students can engage with. I tend to like some of the game-based ones because I do a lot of research around game-based learning as well because it brings in, in – students tend to engage more with those. One of my concerns about a lot of the manipulables that we're getting into classrooms at the moment, particularly the robotic kits, is that they're very – limited to introductory concepts mm -hmm. and they don't allow the ongoing development of more complex concepts over time. The depth. Can you give some examples? Like practical examples? Which ones um, do you like? Which ones do you well, not like? Products right now. <laughs> oh dear, product placements. Um, <laughs> well, some of the traditional ones, uh, such as Lego, particularly how Lego used to be, uh, I yeah. do have some concerns that Lego is moving <laughs> yeah. away from being an all-purpose construction tool to being a set of instructions for building single use. With the kids, yeah. I've noticed that. But fundamentally, Lego is sort of epitomizes the idea where it's something that you can start off with very simple concepts and progressively do very, very complex concepts through more complex activities and constructions and so forth. Similarly, I, I'm quite an advocate of the yeah, Raspberry Pi and the Adreno kits um, and using those to build robotic devices and electronic devices rather than the devices that are easier to use because they've been simplified with some of them with magnetic clips and all the rest, but they tend to have a more limited range of complexity that's achievable. Now, they are getting better, and I, and I don't want to be too harsh on them because many of them are just starting out as companies and kits and so forth. But what I do have criticisms of is the, the very simplified robot kits that can just follow a line or just take in a couple of inputs because uh, they're great for doing an introductory activity and they may be appropriate for year one and year two and so forth. But as soon as students want to do more complex things, they've got to then go to something else. And I think a lot of schools are spending a lot of money at the moment on a whole range of kits that have single purposes. Just as we spent an awful lot of money on computers in the 90s uh, that sat in cupboards and so forth, I've got a fear that there's going to be an awful lot of electronic kits and other manipulables that are going to be sitting in cupboards. Drones are a good example. Unless a drone is programmable, it's almost useless for, as an educational tool. And there's a whole range of other things like that. And I, I'd equate the same for robots. Um, unless it's got a really good, robust programming environment, it's not worth getting. And yeah, things like that. There's a whole range of problems that I'm just working through in some research projects now to try to identify. Of course, I can see a bubble coming very quickly where we spend an awful lot of money and then those that provide that money look at the outcomes and teachers are not able to show that, that money will stop. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of marketing hype in STEM education, especially when it comes to robotics kits. Yes. And uh, overemphasize what you can learn from those kits. Yes. You've mentioned the like for the Raspberry Pi and Arduino. They seem to be, I guess, have a lot much higher barrier to entry. Mm. They, they are. Uh, you know, versus the... I guess the little bits and the Legos of this world. How do you overcome that? That's a level of teacher education. And that's where I do introduce teachers to a lot of the introductory kits, um, as I frame them. Of course, they are useful in getting started. But after a couple of years, the teachers should be able to then move on from those to the more complex kits and also take the students on to more complex activities and projects and so forth. 
what we don't want to see is everyone just doing these introductory um, activities year after year. Of course, that's what killed off ICT education, where we had everyone got super excited over word processing and spreadsheets and <laughs> yep. making web pages. Databases. Yeah. And after doing that year after year after year, the students got fed up with it and stopped wanting to study computing. Yeah. Um, and we saw a huge dramatic de decrease in interest in computing um, by both teachers, students, and school systems. That could happen again with digital technologies and computer science if we just keep at a low level of these introductory kits. That's my concern. How, how do you teach or how do you skill up these teachers in something as complex as a Raspberry Pi or, or Arduino? If they don't have a technical background, right? There's a range of different activities that can be done for that. Um, and even some computer simulations that can assist greatly with that. And then there's the what I call the gateway tools, such as the micro bees and so forth, which allow teachers to get started with the use of control boards and so forth. A simple Arduino robot can be put together by almost any student, not every teacher, mm -hmm. but certainly every <laughs> yeah. student. Um, and I totally understand that teachers are going through a process of confidence building and so forth. But we need to keep the expectations at a level of the outcomes that we want to see achieved by students. If we want to see students really creating innovative new solutions with these technologies as they go into the senior schools, creating the next Facebooks, creating the next robot and inter Internet of Thing type um, devices and interfaces, we have to allow that progression to keep occurring. Yeah. But I, I, I'm completely cognizant of the challenges, but we have to look at where things should be in 10 years. This huge explosion in kits has only occurred in the last two or three years. Before then, there was really only just Lego, and we only had Lego for 20 odd years. Then all of this interest started happening on computer science, and then company after company has started seeing some success. Almost all of them have gone into it with the right purposes. They've seen an opportunity to improve education, and I've got, I've got no criticism of them for doing that. But as they now start maturing into companies with a profit motive, I see um, a marketing hype and concern that hmm. um, we're going we're to go in non, not the most efficient educational outcome directions. <laughs> yeah, I feel very similarly, especially in regards to Lego, since my kids are very much involved with Lego. And it seems like it's a market push into education where products that are really built for their sellability, sellability, I should say, uh, uh, for market purposes, uh, companies like Lego have found another market in the education sector so they can reuse those products and, and um, concepts there in a completely different market. So, uh, yes. Lego's always had a strange engagement with education. Hmm. Mindstorms came from an engagement with MIT and Lego. Mm -hmm. And it was developed entirely as an educational product initially. Then it was proved really successful. And so it then became a mass market product. But then they changed the nature of the product quite substantially to better serve the mass market students at home, et cetera, and went away from the educational focus. So they've acknowledged that to a certain extent and then trying to move things back a bit, particularly now as they're seeing the educational market space expand greatly. Mm, yeah. Of course, a number of competitors, yes. And particularly in the United States, they've been outmarketed by a number of competitive kits that have a lot more flexibility than the mass market Lego kits. Which ones are they? I can think of Modular Robotics, uh, MakeBlock, mm -hmm. uh, Sparky, Sphero. Uh, no, more than Meccano, but the, the ones... Yeah. Not Meccano, though. Um, Meccano's got their own, but then I only need... Like yeah. Meccano. Um, oh, I forget the name of it. The VEX. The VEX system. VEX. Oh, VEX. Yep. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It's by far the most popular in the United States. Mm. Um, and it progresses from the plastic all the way through to the metal. And it's like what Lego used to be. It's just construction material. Mm. Yeah, just the blocks, building blocks, no instructions. Yeah. One of the concerns I have with this preoccupation we have on robots is that robots are pretty useless uh, for problem solving. Mm. Mm. We get students to, we set them, or we ideally have them come up with their own problems in project-based learning, and then look at the technologies that are usable to solve those problems. 
and almost none of the robot kits can actually solve real world problems. Yeah, all right. Mm. And that's where we get into the Internet of Things type area and creating actual solutions to problems, be it a device that assists in cooking or... Watering plants, yeah. turning the lights on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a very good point. And that's where we need to move things on from these introductory robot kits to problem-solving kits that students can then take and come up with their own solutions to really complex real-world problems hmm. with a mix of physical technologies and the digital technologies that can um, enhance that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what the Arduino really, the Raspberry Pi, shine. Yes. I can, I, well, yes. It also shines on cost because <laughs> yes. uh, every, every child could have their own Arduino for less than $5. Very few other technologies have that ability to provide one-to-one uh, -one devices to students. Yeah, maybe not an Arduino, but a knockoff Arduino. A knockoff Arduino, yes. <laughs> yes. Product <laughs> placement. Uh, Jason, uh, you mentioned that a bit earlier. I'm also mindful of time here, but I think this is a good topic that we should get into. You mentioned game-based learning uh, a little bit earlier. Could you tell us a little bit about that? And what does it look like? Okay. Well, the first thing to understand about game-based learning is that there are as many different genres of games, in fact, more genres of games, than there are in literature. Hmm. So to say that everyone loves detective fiction is the same as saying everyone loves a particular game um, system. So we just finished a big four-year study into uh, games and their uses in the classroom. And there's a whole range of different affordances that games can provide. Again, it comes down to what the learning outcomes are and how the games can be used to address those. Now, in my particular field, the use of games to support programming is an easy one. We've been doing it for 20 odd years, having students create computer games. Um, of course, it's something that engages with them in their recreation time and also helps engage them with the development of computer science. Like Minecraft, for example. Uh, Minecraft is actually probably one of the, the clunkier ones for that. It's certainly useful in the early years. And yes, you can do some programming in Minecraft uh, with Redstone and so forth, but um, actually getting into computer languages that are designed for writing computer games. Right. So thinking Unity. Well, they're the more complex ones, um, and they're challenging, but there's a, there's a couple of dozen very popular computer languages that are designed to assist students in writing computer programming uh, and converting their computer programs into computer games. Alice is a very popular one. Yep. Scratch is probably one of the very popular it's ones as well. Scratch. Mm -hmm. But there's lots and lots of them. But that's just one learning area. We're seeing a lot of success with the use of computer games in the teaching of literature and taking the genre of a computer game narrative as a literature art form and having students study that as they would a book or a movie or a poem. Um, and students, because they're very engaged with computer games, will, and particularly reluctant readers, um, many boys, <laughs> will engage in great depth with understanding the narrative of computer games. So these are computer games with context, with people that have certain backgrounds, with a storyline, which in a way simulates or emulates literature? Is it Pac-Man or...? Yes, that's certainly one aspect. But again, there are dozens and dozens of different types of computer games. There's also mathematical-based computer games. There's, com there's physics simulation computer games. Having a truck simulator and understanding the physics of driving a vehicle or a uh, so forth. My kids play a space simulator where they construct their own solar oh. system. The oh. Yeah, it's called Universe okay, yeah. Sandbox. Universe Sandbox, yeah, it's on the on the computer, yeah. Yep, so that would be useful in teaching about science. Mm -hmm. So yep. the idea is that treating computer games as simply a whole range of technologies that can be applied to different learning areas um, to meet different learning outcomes as are required. Now, there are more traditional things that people think about of computer games, such as the typing tutors and the maths tutors, and they're good for repetitive practice. But we need to understand that there's lots and lots of different applications of computer games, as there are with ICT, and not just thinking of them as one particular type. That's probably the biggest aspect that would be My own particular area of research into computer games goes off into a rather esoteric area called secondary world development where students build a fantasy world in their engagement with computer games and often will take that outside of computer games into their own artwork and their own writing and so forth. And they 
turn those characters into and use them in other contexts, hmm. particularly if they get very involved in the fandom related to the games. But that's a that's another story. Well, yeah, that's another big one. Um, what can we do to get more girls into computer science and actually STEM in general, not just computer science? That seems to be a, still a problem after this, that many years. You're covering all my areas. Um, okay. <laughs> Very methodical here. <laughs> well, we've just released the report last year or the year before, Girls and Computing. Yep. And it was rather critical of our current practices in trying to get girls into computing, fundamentally because we've failed so badly. Hmm. And the trend has been continuing down since the 90s when... Really? So it's dec- the ratios decrease? Yes. Wow. Um, Female participation in, in computing has been going down by about about 10% a year. Hmm. In Queensland, we were not going, we weren't too bad in our senior computing. We were still at about 30%. In Victoria and um, New South Wales, it was down to about 5% in schools. Yeah. It bumps up a bit again in universities, but still, still very poor. We've started seeing some changes, and a lot of the research we looked at was comparing the efforts that were done to get girls into mathematics and science education, which have been successful in the main. We're still down a bit from what boys are doing, but in many areas, girls are now surpassing boys in maths and science education. Mm, interesting. And many of the same problems had to be addressed um, in order to see that turnaround. But if you look at the trends, maths and science is going up, uh, engineering and computing is still going down. So we looked at very closely at what was the potential differences? And there was only one difference that we could identify, and that was that maths and science are taught in schools where computer science and engineering are not. And they are normalized as part of the curriculum. So all of the efforts that are put in, or a large majority of the efforts that are put into getting girls into computing are done by out-of-school activities, by doing special activities that give girls a special opportunity to um, do something in computing. The problem is that the decline happens at adolescence. Up until then, girls are holding their ground with boys. They've shown just as much interest in computing. But at that particular time, and what we theorize is that that is a particular time when girls want to be accepted as part of their peer group. All right, right. So taking them outside of that peer group and making them doing something special and different to their peer group is not something that actually is particularly productive. So is, is it not cool? Is yeah. that the long shot of it? In other words. No, it, it's more than just being not cool. That, that we've, we've sort of overcome the, the nerdy aspect of it. It's more that they're doing something that is making them different to the majority of their peers. And for some girls, that's fine. They don't mind being different. But for the large majority of them, that's a, a negative impediment. Hmm. And so they would much rather be involved in activities with the majority of their peer group right. than doing something that is special. So what we're really hoping is that because we're now normalizing computer science, it's becoming part of the curriculum and every girl does it. So it's no longer going to be something that's going to be special and distinctive, that that will then mean that they won't see being part of computer science as taking them away from their peer group. And over the next sort of five to 10 years, hopefully we should see an improvement um, as we did see in maths and science. So if I understand right, the a potential solution to this problem to, to equate the ratios there would be to get engineering and computer science more deeply entrenched in the normal school curriculum so that all girls would be actually the subject to it, but they would have to go through it like any other subject, like mathematics, in which they excel. Correct. It's quite interesting because normally you hear this as yeah. that from the narrative that it's a boys' club. Yeah. And uh, you know, not really letting the women in. Well, that's when that's when we didn't have any computing in schools, any computer science in schools. Mm-hmm. So there was always the extracurricular activities, and they were very popular with boys. And it was seen that doing the same for girls would be the logical thing to address that. But that didn't prove the case. Now, all of that said, I am involved in some other research that is looking at some more complex issues around gender and computer science. And unfortunately, it's showing that there may be some societal issues 
that are going to reduce female participation in computing. And a lot of that has to do with how computing has developed. Even the language of computing, and we probably don't have time for me to explain it in any effective depth, but essentially boys become used to abstraction because of their separation from their mothers. Girls remain concrete in their thinking processes because they retain their close relationship with their mothers. And that has a fundamental difficulty with computing because computing has arisen in its power through the process of abstraction. Yep. And because girls are not as effective with ab abstraction, and we can relate that to a simple example of a doll and how, how a boy and a girl will treat a doll. A girl will treat the doll as though it's a human being. It has its own personality, and that doll is unique. Mm -hmm. That Barbie is, is Sally Ann, and uh, she loves that Sally Ann because it's, it's her specific doll. A boy will treat it as an abstract object. It is simply a doll. Right. And it doesn't matter if that's the same doll as another doll. And that carries through into how we've actually developed computing. Of course, computing in its power has all to do with abstraction. And then there's a whole area of the language of computing, which is actually quite male dominated. It's around deleting and executing and... Destroy, <laughs> exclamation mark. Just yeah, a whole range of method. quite violent <laughs> languages yeah. that have evolved in terms of that. And some of, the, some of the research has shown that girls, if they get into computing, have to actually suppress their concrete relationship uh, processes in order to engage with abstraction, where boys can just simply abstract away. Now, the only other bit that I'm slowly getting involved with in this is through my research in artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is actually all about relationships. And it's an area where girls may excel because it's all about developing unique relationships with devices that have their own personalities and are not abstracted as we have been with more traditional technologies that boys have excelled in. So it's a general artificial intelligence. Yes. So taking things away from being generalizable to being concrete and having a relationship with a, a device or an item that you have a personal, that has its mm. own personality. That's very interesting. If you think about all the consumer grade <laughs> AI, like Siri yep. and Cortana, and all, they're all females. Oh, they've uh, been given Alexa. <laughs> Alexa, yeah. And I theorize a lot of the success of our um, devices, such as the mobile phones that have become very popularized, is because people have been able to develop a relationship with them. Hmm. And they're not just an abstracted technology. They're something that's yours, it's unique, and it's individualized with all your own photos and uh, personal profiles and all the rest that makes it individualized. And girls naturally can think in that way stronger than boys can. Now, it's controversial because anything to do with biology and, and gender is a hot issue, uh, but it does seem to be flowing through in terms of some aspects. A lot of research needs to be done to verify any of that because it hasn't been, but that's mm. an area that I'm also exploring. Yeah, it's, it is controversial. But yeah, in a previous conversation with Dr. Hunter, she brought up the same issues as well. So it is something that needs to be looked at uh, over the next uh, few years. And as like, in, in the context of education, artificial intelligence is coming in, um, the things we talked about earlier in regards to virtual reality, augmented reality and so on, all these technologies do seem to be a lot more personal than uh, the old technologies, including the blackboard. So do you expect to see changes in the ratios? I hope so. Just, just um, organically, I mean, without yeah. uh, no policy makers making changes? Well, I think there has to be more understanding of the processes involved. Of course, there will always be, you don't want women that are assigned, um, computer science females that are assigned tasks that involve lots of abstraction to be doing that if that's not their strengths. Um, and if we can identify that there are particular strengths related to gender, then we can make use of those strengths and overcome any uh, potential weaknesses. And I hope that that's the case, but in either event, the process of normalizing computer science education and hopefully the use of these more concrete relational-based um, learning objects in the teaching of computing will engage girls in a more 
effective way than what we've seen in the past. Is that a, simply a stage thing? Like uh, I'm talking about the abstractions here, because I can't imagine the like being able to do abstract thinking is. It, I can't. I was doing programming today, and I'm looking something up on the internet, and bang, there's a, a lady that was explaining how to do something. Oh. And I've actually been seeing that anecdotally more and more, where I've been uh, trying to solve a problem, uh, look for the code online, and say, like, oh, who's this guy? I should have a look Don't at what he does. Oh, <laughs> right. yeah, it's like, wow, okay. Um, there's so, always the odd ones out. Well, I don't think it's the odd ones out thing. I think it's just uh, change that's happening now. Yeah. Yep. But with the abstraction side of things, is that purely, you know, at a certain age group, they're finding it a little bit more difficult to do this abstraction uh, side of things, and that's something that just, you know, goes down over time as the, as they grow up. As people change, that changes as well. Yeah, let's imagine, like, the physiological, uh, like, changes in the brain mm -hmm. over time. No, it, well, it's definitely a learned behaviour. So it's a process, but it's such an ingrained behaviour from our child development processes that the research that I've seen on it and so forth really does suggest that it stays with most people their entire lives. We learn to overcome any, we learn to cope with those and to build to our strengths and overcome weaknesses. But just as boys are naturally more aggressive in the development process, that can be overcome in both directions as well. So there's a whole range of things. Um, I don't believe it has a genetic um, disposition. I believe it's a, a process of our child development, but it's such an ingrained one that I don't see that changing anytime soon. So we need to develop uh, processes in our education systems to account for those and to strengthen and support. Hmm. Encourage. Both sides, yeah. yeah. So I'm a parent who's got a boy and two girls. How should I be supporting my girls and uh, I guess developing the... Hmm ideas of uh, abstraction? Well, I think one of the, the, the kits is probably one of the best ones, like Lego and so forth, where being able to take a set of materials and turn it into a whole range of different things and to pull apart things and to re-put them back in different ways, that helps the process of abstraction. There's a range of different things you could do around computer languages and computer programming as well. But I don't think... One of my big concerns is that it looks like females have to develop coping strategies to suppress their relationship aspects in relation to computing. And I don't think that's the way to go in the long term. I think we need to work out ways where we can build on the strength of relationship processes in computing and the concrete elements um, in those aspects around AI and so forth um, that give girls an advantage in those aspects. Because I do think computing is moving more towards that particularly as we come to human computer interface aspects. I don't want to dumb things down to web interface and all that sort of stuff, but the real processes of digital devices interacting with human beings is an area where girls, it's supposed, will have a much greater strength um, than boys. And yeah. I think we need to play on that strength. Okay. Has there been any uh, research into consumption versus making uh, between the two genders? Because I look at my boy and he, he doesn't really consume that much. He makes, he makes, he makes. And I look at uh, one of my daughters and she just consumes media oh, right. and books and isn't that hands-on hands on and making. Yeah. There's a whole lot of anecdotal, some of it's anecdotal, some of it has some research behind it. But in general, girls will construct something for a purpose. Boys will do it for any odd reason. Ah, oh, right. So you, yeah. so you need to give a context. So if it's, it's for building a birdhouse for a bird in the backyard, girls will get just as engaged with that as boys will. Hmm. But if it's just a process of building a house for the sake of it, that's not something that interests girls because they don't see the relationship aspect of that. They don't see the, the benefit um, to society or someone for doing that aspect. So I do think you need to give more context to girls. And we do this in the classrooms as well, teaching girls. Um, I taught girls computer science for 20 odd years. Um, and yeah, what interests me in a task won't necessarily interest the girls. But given a good context, they can become just as engaged with almost any tasks that you could engage boys with. It just needs a different process. But likewise, getting boys engaged with the relationship side of activities, doing documentation, for example, or doing up interface that works well with human beings is not something that boys are particularly good at. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, personal so experience. Soft skills, right. we're talking about. I really had to struggle to build a decent well, business. I, I wouldn't call them soft skills. I would okay. define them as a whole set of skills that involve a whole range of different processes. Um, and they're ones that boys don't value and are not particularly good at as a generalization. There's always different, there's always um, outliers. But while there are these differences, I think we can utilize them to explore the benefits from both sides. We do need to keep researching and trying to work out if there's ways of removing the differences. But I think that's a long term process. And mm. in the short term, we need to look at ways of making sure that both genders have equal advantages in the digital economy and the jobs and so forth that are going to be, or well, that are emerging from that. Yeah. Jason, I'd like to uh, start winding down our conversation and I'd like to ask you about recommended reading materials, either book or papers or you know, online uh, resources on the areas of innovation in technology, educational technology, curriculum, manipulables, for example, robotics, things that you think that, uh, say, a, a new teacher or a teacher that wants to become better in STEM should read. My biggest advice would be to look back at Papert's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was done in the 50s and 60s, but it's still far more relevant than almost anything else that exists. And it's we're probably returning to where they were in the very early decade of computing um, at the moment, where we've been off on a tangent looking at ICTs and consuming technology, and we're just starting to reemerge to where we were 40 odd years ago. So go back to the basics. Yes, but they're not just basics, they're actually the way forward. Yeah. In terms of understanding how students can learn about and with technology. And it's not just with in terms of it being using the technology, it's actually being partners in the learning process where the technology is learning and we're learning with it and understanding that and being able to take advantage of that because that's where the advantage is going to be in the next couple of decades, students that can actually work with the new technologies as equal partners, not trying to sub subjugate it, not trying to just utilize it, but being able to accept and function in a space where the technology is contributing just as much to work and leisure and scientific research and all the rest as they will. Is uh, a particular book by Samuel Puppet that is a must read by educators? Uh, Mindstorms would be the Mindstorms, must read. That's, right, yep. Ooh. That would be the starting point. But there's lots of his writings that have really good gems in them. Awesome. It's a little bit acronistic, but if you unpack it, there's a lot we can be learning from in order to move forward. And we really haven't moved much beyond where he got to way back then. Yeah. So that's a, the, the book that he wrote in 1980, just looking at the, uh, the book Information Here, Google just found it immediately. It's amazing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Great. Um, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, I have a website, lots of websites, but um, <laughs> my way, main one is jason.zagami.info or by email or just, just search Zagami. There's not too many of us. Yeah, yeah, your website is actually very well stocked with a lot of information there and also links to very uh, interesting resources and courses and, and some of them go to Griffith University, which seems like, a, like a, it, you guys have got a few courses that, uh, that look really good for teachers and inspiring teachers. Oh, I, I had to ask yeah. a postscript question. Yeah, go for it. You mentioned that you're teaching teachers essentially via MOOC on digital technologies mm -hmm. and how to implement the new curriculum. Were you teaching them hardware via that? Uh, yes, um, it was a requirement. Well, it, it was a Queensland government funded initiative. And yes, they all had to have a robot. A, they all got a, an Edison robot, a BBC um, microbit card yep. and something else. Uh, but yes, no, I did have them all get some hardware as part of that. And that was part of the funding uh, for that project. Okay, I was just I was wondering how you would troubleshoot all of that. Um, what was the failure rate on the Edisons, by the way? <laughs> Far too high. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I had, I had great hopes for the Edison because it had some fantastic input processes whereby it used sound and, and light. But yes, unfortunately, there was quite a high failure rate with those particular technologies. Um, 
I am supportive of Australian companies and so forth, but they do need to improve their quality control somewhat. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we had uh, many issues with uh, Edison's, I'm afraid, which is a shame. Because aren't they based in Adelaide or? Uh, I think they're, they're, yeah. they are Australian, but they're made in China because all our deliveries of Edison's come from China. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Zagami, thank you very much for your time. It was really, really awesome discussion. I really enjoyed it. Yes, thank you. No problems at all. Bye-bye. That's all for this episode. The notes for this episode that include links to many of the resources mentioned and information on how to get in touch with Jason are available on our website, texplore.com forward slash pay forward slash STEMiverse. Each episode comes with its own page on the Tech Explorations website and a gold mine of information in the notes. This Stemverse podcast episode was produced by Tech Explorations. Do you have any questions or suggestions? Would you like to nominate a friend or colleague to be our guest? Please email us at pa at texplore.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, STEMiverse. That's S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.